So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by the delightful John Menders, whom I met several months ago, and he is the host of the Walk to Wealth podcast, as well as the founder of Stop and Stare Media. Welcome to the show, John. Lovely to have you here. Never. I'm super excited to be here and I'm super excited to see where our conversation takes us today because I got tons of nuggets that I want to share. Yeah, yeah. We were just having a quick chat before we came onto the podcast. I know you've got so much information you want to share, which I'm really looking forward to hearing as well. And we never know where these things are going to go, right? It, it's very much a, a genuine chat. We're not editing this. It's just, let's just see where we get to. So I'm going to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about your story, you know, how you've got to where you are now and um, a couple of things that you're really proud of as well. So professionally and personally, what are you really proud of? Yeah, so my story to take you guys back in the time machine a little bit. I grew up in a project. It was nine of us in a two bedroom. Money was always tight. We had section eight, which is like government subsidized housing, food stamps, which again, like gov government subsidized stuff uh, because money was super tight. My mother, she suffered from mental health issues. And as a kid, those things are kind of hard to grasp. It's like you, you want a mother in terms of the traditional mother figure, but it's like she's suffering from things that you can't even comprehend because your brain is not too young to even comprehend those things. So me and her had a really shaky relationship. My father, he was absent. So my grandparents on my Dominican side of the family raised me and they don't speak a lick of English. Like they don't know anything besides maybe thank you. That's probably about it. And so growing up, this entrepreneurial spirit, I wasn't um, selling in the lemonade stands. I didn't have the paper route. I didn't have all the typical stories that your traditional entrepreneur has. For me, mm -hmm. money and business was something that was completely absent in my life. Now, fast forward a little bit. I'm in college now. This is during the pandemic. It's 2020 and it was fall 2020. I still remember like it was yesterday. I ended up walking into Barnes and Nobles and I picked up three books. One of them was Index Funds for Dummies. One of them was a book called I Will Teach You To Be Rich. And the third one, which was the, actually the first book that I read, it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I've read that yeah. book and from there my paradigm shifted and I've realized That's that there was another way of you agreed and it's like I realized there's another way of viewing the world that wasn't being taught in school wasn't being taught in my environment but more importantly it wasn't being taught at all at my home and so from there I let my curiosity pretty much just take the reins and that fall, that winter break between fall and spring semester I just jumped down the rabbit hole mind you this is the pandemic I didn't have anything better to do so I just started watching YouTube videos podcast <laughs> episodes reading books I had all this free time and so when I came back spring semester I was still taking classes from home and now I was like I spent this whole winter break learning more about stuff that actually matters than I did in my entire year of schooling combined I was like, man, I can't unseen the light. So with the entire world being uncertain, the only thing I was certain of was myself. So I decided to bet on me. I signed up for my real estate classes, dropped out of college, and I have not looked back. And that's how I got into entrepreneurship. <laughs> it's really funny. I was actually just um, signing off on, a, on our social media post and I was talking about the fact that, you know, degrees, I, I wouldn't say that they're a complete waste of time because they certainly teach you something about learning, but they really, they're not the way to get on in life. It's really your attitude and, and that learning you can get from amazing people around you. So well done. So um, tell me, so what, so where are you at now? Tell me what you're up to now. Yeah, so now that this, I spent a year probably going through shiny object syndrome, like 2022, mm -hmm. I jokingly say is the year of the squirrel. Because, man, I was a little squirrel, and at every shiny opportunity I seen, my head they just just kept on turning. I was trying to bite on every opportunity I could put my hands on. So I was a licensed real estate agent. I was working part-time in a restaurant almost 30 hours. I was teaching social media classes to hundreds of realtors across the U.S. and Canada for free. And I had a podcast, which I was doing weekly episodes. And I was doing all these things and it looked great for my bio because I hired someone on Fiverr and they make everything look good. So <laughs> if you need a bio, definitely go to Fiverr because they make you sound like you're a genius. Uh, but in all actuality, everything was failing. My podcast numbers were going down. My social media classes, I wasn't making any money from that stuff. I was working part time at the restaurant and I wanted to leave back in February of 2022. I still happen to be there now from the time we're recording this. And then the real estate stuff. I only sold three rentals, which was like virtually no money, right? So all these things that I wanted to do was just entirely failing. And what I realized was I was procrastinating from the things I needed to do, not mm -hmm. because I was scared, not because I wasn't taking action, not because I didn't have the skills or traits or personality necessary. I was procrastinating because I wasn't aligned with what I was truly called to do. So I spent a lot of time looking within, a lot of time mm -hmm. reflecting, and 
once around December, I came across this concept called Ikigai. And it's pretty much, long story short, it's your reason for being. It's a Japanese concept. And Mm -hmm. then I realized that this podcast and this speaking thing, and that's what I'm, what I'm really feel called to do. And since then, I've been able to start speaking at conferences. My podcast just hit top five percent globally. The social media wow. side of things, I, you know, I'm still doing classes. I was gonna do content creation services. I scrapped that idea up, but then I came back around and I um, sold a course. So now I got eight students in there, and that's growing strong. And so now I've been able to do so much more. But it took a lot of realigning, and it took a lot of dying off. Like I'm no longer focused in real estate. My license is still active, but I had to let that go. I had to let all these stuff go, go in order to make room for what I was truly called to do. And now, ever since I started to focus up and get more intentional, this year I've been able to find my stride and get a lot more traction in my business and my you know, overall life. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely true. Ikigai is a great concept, and it's something similar to what we do in EOS. We actually make people be really clear about the reason why they exist, because it gives you something to tap back into when times are tough, but it also makes sure that all of your um, arrows are moving in the same direction or rowing in the same direction. So it's really important to actually get a, a strong sense of you know why you exist. So well done on recognizing that. So now you're, you know, you're helping people with their marketing, and I know that a lot of people are struggling with finding new clients. Uh, they're worried about the potential recession around the world tell us a little bit about how you know what do you say to that and how do you help people in terms of finding clients yeah so this is concept i came up with through real estate because as i said i was doing all these things and once i started to focus on my podcast i was like how do i take all this knowledge and lessons and skills that i learned in one industry and transfer it to what i'm doing now despite this being an entirely different industry and one of the amazing things i picked up was the concept of circle prospecting and so while i was in real estate i had an open house it was like an eight hundred thousand dollar colonial one of my friends was listing the house and she was busy she was out of town she was like hey john do you want to do the open house for it and i was like okay so leading up to it i was like man it's a pretty nice house it's a very very desirable neighborhood where i'm from i'm gonna go door knock on all the neighbors and tell them about it and hand them flyers. So that open house, I ended up getting close to 30 families within two hours, which was like a super busy open house. And I was by myself. So I was Mm -hmm. like, from like five minutes before the even open house started to like the very end, to like 20 minutes after, I was packed with people coming in the doors looking at the house. And I learned that day, that concept of circle prospect, I did it in person. So now I'm in the podcasting niche now in the entrepreneurship niche with my course that I'm selling. And I was like, all right, how do I take this and apply it into what I'm doing? And so what I realized is if you can connect with one person, you can then connect with the people they're connected to. And a lot of this game of like online marketing is perceived value. And nothing per- boosts your perceived value more than being seen with other people that people already look up to. So the first step in that though, because you can connect with a lot of people, if they don't have the ideal audience that you have, you're connecting with people and you're pretty much not going to get anything from it. So step number one is defining your ideal avatar. And you're probably very familiar with this, but not in the demographic sense where everyone talks about normally with the education and employment and age and gender, et cetera, et cetera. The psychographics, you got to get into their mind. So this is something I learned from Jim Edwards. He, he's a big, big time copywriter and he talks about the PQRR, right? So it's problems, questions, and roadblocks. That's what your ideal ha- avatar has right now. Right, these mm-hmm. problems, questions, and roadblocks are holding them back to where they want to get to, which is the last R, the ideal result. Right, so now they have these problems, questions, and roadblocks. Let's say they're on one side of a cliff. Now there's a big chasm in the middle, and on the other side, there's another cliff. That's where the result is. And right now, they don't have any way to get to the other side because all these problems, questions, and roadblocks are holding them back. Once you understand those things, then you become the bridge. You understand. Mm-hmm. All your content is addressing the problems, the questions, and the roadblocks that they have so that you can get them from where they're currently at to the result that they want to be. So that's the PQRR, and it's really understanding where they're currently at and Mm -hmm. really magnetizing your marketing message that you put out there, not just looking for age and the traditional stuff. It's like really understanding them at a deeper psychological level and understand what they're going through so that you can attract more people instead of going out there fishing where there's no one to be found. 
Yeah, and that's a really good point. And something we actually teach in the US as well. We kind of talk to people about, you know, what is your ideal target market? And it isn't just how old they are and how much money they make, but it really does come down to, you know, what are the, the challenges that they're actually facing? Talk about the pain points they've got and how are they think, you know, how do they think? Because we're not for everybody. I find a lot of people, you know, you ask them who their ideal client is and they say everyone. And it's like, nah, because if you try to be everything to everybody, you're actually nothing to nobody. So being very, very clear about, you know, who that person is you're going after, how they think, how they feel, what their issues are, and, and really developing the messaging, I think is absolutely spot on. But how do you, how do you do that? I mean, um, yeah. you know, you're you're an expert in marketing. Tell us a bit about how you actually really do that, because it's very it's a great the big URR is a great way to look at it. Yeah. But how, where do you even start? Yeah, so this is probably the best way, and I'm telling you this because this is exactly what I screwed over. So with my course, <laughs> right? Let's think of a yeah. chocolate bar, right? Yes. Let's say you have the best chocolate on the market, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have the wrong wrapper, you're never gonna sell. So a lot of people, they don't spend any time re pretty much doing market research to figure out what wrapper they should put on there. And so what I'm literally currently doing, so I have eight students and that was with me completely skipping out on market research. So imagine how many I would have if I had done my market research. And so what I'm doing right now is literally every contact in my phone that I know from real estate as a real estate agent. I'm calling up everyone and I have a spreadsheet in front of me that I've created on a Google Sheets. Super simple spreadsheet and it's literally question number one, well, box number one is what are the biggest challenges and frustrations you're currently going through right now when it comes to insert whatever your niche is. So mine is yeah. building an online presence. So I'm asking them yeah. what are your biggest challenges and frustrations when it comes to building on an online presence. Then my mm -hmm. second question is what are your biggest fears around insert whatever your niche is for me mm -hmm. creating content what are your biggest fears around creating content then the third question is what are you currently doing to fill in the blank again for me as I said building an online presence what are you currently doing to build your online presence where are they currently at right they're on this cat on this cliff but I'm literally telling them to explain to me in their words where they're at so that then when you start creating landing pages when you start doing you know creating copy all this stuff that i have in a spreadsheet that's going to be this exact verbiage that i use i'm going to literally use their exact verbiage so that i can mm -hmm. connect with them more right so that's question number three question number four is in an ideal world assuming you had all the time money energy etc necessary what would it look like you know if you had all that for, as i said for me it's building an online presence so how much you know what would you be posting in the ideal world if you had all the time energy and knowledge necessary right and then question number five is if you could wave a magic wand what would you need to get from where you're at currently to where you want to be so it's like that's my five questions that i'm asking literally going on the phone old school and just dialing up realtors and it's like hey i'm doing a quick survey uh, pretty much just figure out where all my real estate friends are struggling with currently right now. You have a mm -hmm. couple minutes and this should take no longer than five to seven minutes per call. Like keep it nice and quick and concise. You may come across a couple people that'll talk your heads, you know, your head off. <laughs> get, That's get okay, to the they're point they're choosing to do point. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but so for me, as like I said, now I'm, I'm listening, literally calling all these people. I'm also on like Facebook groups and I'm asking uh, questions like, you know, pretty much one of the five questions like, what are your biggest struggles and concerns? Mm -hmm. I also have an email list. I literally asked them, hey, my subject line was, hey, quick favor and an announcement. And in the body of the text is pretty much, hey, I'm doing a quick survey, pretty much asking you guys, like, what are you currently struggling with? Something like that. And then I pretty much, it's a very short, very, very short email, very casual email. And then I send them to a landing page that literally has one question. And the question's in something along the lines of, you know, what are the two biggest questions you want answered when it comes to, as I said, mine is building an online presence. And so these yeah. questions that they're now filling out in the survey, it's pretty much the exact thing. So when I start posting my videos on YouTube, yep. that's going it's to be literally my YouTube titles. It's exactly what they're looking up. So I'm doing market research from three different levels. I'm calling on the phone. I'm mm -hmm. posting in Facebook, making like social media posts that have polls and stuff for them to answer. And then I'm also sending out surveys via email. You don't have to go, I mean, just going on the phone would probably work perfectly fine, but I want to and make I sure I understand them from all as angles. 
Yeah, and I think that's actually really important. I think a lot of people are afraid to pick up the phone these days. It's so much easier to send out an email or, or a survey monkey or whatever. But in actual fact, um, it, you get much more cut through when you're actually talking to people live, in old school, as you call it, on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I think the important thing is not to sell on that call, right? You're not there to sell to them at all. Yeah. You're there to actually just gather information. And I think that's what a lot of people do wrong. They do, they do it on social media. They do it on the phone call. They get on a phone call and they immediately start telling you about their widget or their service and, and how wonderful it is. It's like there's no there's no poor there's no there's no nothing before that it's it's very much um cold selling you're actually just using it to then create content that creates a relationship over time is that right a hundred percent a hundred percent you have to you can't withdraw from an empty atm you have to deposit yeah. first deposit yeah. deposit 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 keep on yeah. depositing and one of my favorite quotes by alex Ramosi is the longer the runway the larger the plane that could take off so ah. if you just keep on giving, 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 you yeah. could launch a pretty big plane, but you mm -hmm. have to delay it long enough for that plane to take off. You could have a short runway and then do a little quick give and then ask and give and again ask. But if you just give, eventually the people will be like drooling at the mouth to give back to you because of the law of reciprocity. People don't feel comfortable just taking on the time. So it's eventually, if you don't ever ask for anything, it'll get to yep. a certain point in time where the tides will kind of tip over. And it's like, John, stop giving me free stuff or I'm going to start throwing money at you, essentially. So it's like, <laughs> just keep on depositing and it'll come back in goodwill because goodwill compounds faster than anything else yep. will. Yeah, actually, it's really interesting. You, you talk about, you read a lot of books, obviously, so do I. And there's the Go Giver series. Have you ever read that, the Bob Berg series, um, which is called I have not, actually, yeah. Ah, oh, you have to look it up. There's five books in, in this series, and it's all—it's exactly that. It's the law of reciprocity. It's you know, give without any expectation of anything in return, and the more you give, the more you will receive. And it's—it's it's a really great book, just just for people who maybe haven't got their heads around that concept, because for a lot of people that's foreign. It's like, but you know, why would I do that if I'm not going to get anything in return? But as you said, the longer the runway you build, the better, the bigger the plane that can take off. So, cool. Now I know that you do um, a little bit of a, a, a talk around how you can ethically steal other people's audiences <laughs> do you want yeah. to give us a little bit of insight into that because i love that as a title and that's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> actually so i put that a quick little sidebar i put that in a headline analyzer and i got a hundred percent so <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a pretty good headline so make sure that no one steals it um, but <laughs> okay. for the most part that just that was step one is creating an ideal avatar and we just went super deep on it and mm. step number two then is find out where they congregate for example if you wanted to work with fitness people you could most likely find them at a CrossFit gym. If you wanted to work with, let's say, Christians for whatever reason, you could find yep. them at the church on at Sunday. Church. If yeah. you wanted to work with, you know, let's say, stock traders, you could probably find them on Wall Street. It's like mm -hmm. the people that you want to work with are hanging out somewhere. You got to find out where they're hanging out at. You got to figure out where it is that they're already gathering up. Someone already took the time, energy, and effort necessary to build up the spot. You just have to find where the spot is. That is mm -hmm. it. Don't create your own spot. It's in, in extremely hard to build up an audience from scratch. It is insanely difficult, no matter how much everyone else tells you. It is <laughs> insanely difficult. So what you want to do is you want to figure out where they're already at. And once you do that, then step number three is join the community. And I'll share with you a story. So when you go, most people, when they join a community, it's, hey guys, I have this course, or hey guys, this is my podcast, or hey guys, do whatever, I have this lead magnet. And it's like, they're just asking, asking, asking. So here's how I pretty much got my spark in the community I'm in with all my realtor friends. So essentially, I'm a brand new real estate agent, just got licensed, I'm 20 years young. And it's like, I don't know anything about this space. And I was on this mastermind call or like this big group call um, every morning, Monday through Friday. And it was like a scripts call where they would just practice their sales scripts. And I was on this call and every Friday was question Friday. And so we would have one main objection and everyone would give their best objection handler. And so what I started doing is I would just write all the objection handlers in the chat for everyone. And now here's where I took it a step further. Most people would save the chat and upload it into the Facebook group. What I started doing is I took the chat, saved it, uploaded it into a Google Doc, took out all the little banter in between, and just left only the objection handlers. Then I formatted it, I changed the font, made it look a little nice, then uploaded it to Facebook group. And so now, every Friday, it was like, where's John? Where's John? Yeah, John, can you describe? John, you buy a computer? Yeah. John, 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 we need to describe every Friday, because they knew 
I was coming from contribution and then providing value. But then it gets yeah. a step further because coming from contribution is essential, especially when you don't have an audience, you don't really have a reputation. But if you do already have a reputation, it's just going to make you paint you that much of a better picture in the, eye, in the eyes of your ideal avatar, in the eyes of your fellow colleagues and peers, right? Yeah. So what I did is every morning there's another call as well that I was on Monday through Friday. One of the days they were talking about social media. And what I did is I just created a quick tip. It was like five tips on the Facebook post. Normally at the gym, I was at the gym at the time, so I couldn't share on Clubhouse yeah. vocally. So I was just like, I just take what I wanted to share, put it in the Facebook group, and that's what I did. Then one of the hosts of the group, she was like, hey, John, would you mind teaching a class on this subject? And I was like, I never taught a class before, instead of saying yes. <laughs> and she was like, John, let us know when you want it scheduled. And I was like, well, I can't go tell a big time real estate agent no twice. So <laughs> I'm not going to fumble the opportunity twice. So I ended up deciding, I was like, all right, screw it. I'll figure it out. I ended up getting 440 people to sign up for my very first class ever on social media marketing yeah, right out fantastic. the gate. I spent more time manually sending out invites because I didn't know how to use Eventbrite or MailChimp <laughs> than I did actually preparing for the class. But nevertheless, I ended up figuring it out. And from there, I instantly went from nobody in the group to an instant thought leader in seconds yep. just yeah. because I came from contribution and the opportunity to present itself to give value. And the only reason I started charging for the social media stuff was because literally after my second class, which I also had over 400 people sign up at the end, I had a Q and a portion that was open. I left the last 10 minutes for Q and a one of, uh, one of my millionaire real estate agent friends down in Maryland, she's a big time agent. And she was like, John, do not ever teach another one of these classes for free again without charging next time charge and they were asking me like john what's your venmo what's your zelle what's your and i was just like honestly full transparency i didn't charge because i didn't feel worthy of charging that was a limiting belief that i didn't even know i had that i had to overcome but even if i did I, you know i never did that with the intention of let me start teaching social media classes so i can get some money off of these people <laughs> It was like they asked me and they poured value into me. So this is my way of giving back to the community. And as I said, I gave so much value back to what I said about the law of reciprocity. They mm -hmm. wanted to give money back to me without me even having to ask because they felt bad for all the value I gave them and they didn't give me anything in return. But I wasn't looking for anything in return. That's what made the difference. Yeah, no, I, I completely, um, we're on the same page. We have actually, one of our core values at EOS is help first. And when you define help first, it's, it's about giving without any expectation or anything in return. Um, and it's what I loved about EOS. It's part of the reason why I joined them was because I, I truly believe that. I, I know that if you help people, um, yeah, it, it is the law of reciprocity. I think what's really interesting, a lot of people struggle. They think, well, if I give away all my secret sauce, um, you know, then, then why would they come to me? But it's actually quite the opposite. There's very, I mean, there's very little you can't Google and find out about, right? If you want to learn how to give a talk on social media, you can probably Google it and you probably do a, a social media talk on it. So it's, it's not about information. It's actually about relationships and how you work together to help each other. 100%. And that's the next part, right? Step yeah. number four is after you find your ideal avatar, you figure out where they hang out, you join the community. Mm -hmm. Step number four is connect with the ringleader. Every community yeah. has its own ringleader. Every community has someone that hosts it, that runs it, that is in charge, that's the popular guy or popular gal in the group, mm -hmm. every community. And for me, the social media stuff is how I got in cahoots with the with the leader of those real estate groups that's how i started getting massive notoriety within the little mastermind which is actually a pretty big mastermind it's because yeah. i was able to connect with that person and now when you do that that opens up tons of doors so when i taught my you know i taught my first workshop in january so i'd normally do like free classes and that would be it mm -hmm. but it was like john like we want to go deeper when i taught my first master class like workshop um, I upsold it from a masterclass and I didn't have like a big old, you know, typical sales close at the end of a presentation of the webinar. I was like, Hey guys, you know, I'm teaching this workshop on Friday. I taught the class on a Wednesday, I believe. I was like, Friday, I'm teaching this workshop. It's going to be from like one to three. Um, if you guys can make it kind of type of thing, very awkward. I wasn't used to pitching anything at the end of a webinar. As I said, I'm used to teaching all that stuff for free. And then the next morning I hopped on the call. And I filled in the 10 slots. It was like, I think 200 bucks, uh, 200 bucks a pop, uh, per seat. And I hopped yep. on the call that next morning the, that she runs and those seats filled up instantly. So I got 10 originally or 10 or 12 originally from the webinar. And then I got yep. the last eight or 10, uh, the next morning because she allowed me to go in the group and literally just like 
she she pitched me i didn't even have yeah. to pitch myself she was like guys go you sign up for his workshop and so it's like once you connect with these people that's going to open up doors and opportunity for you to promote yourself for you to present yourself in ways that you wouldn't have had the opportunity and as i said mm -hmm. you didn't spend any time money energy or effort building up that audience they already did but then the last step to put it all together is bring step them home five, yep okay. step number five is bring them home or essentially call to action you have to have something so for example i was doing all yep. these social media classes and everything but i'd had no list so if all this Facebook stuff went away, all these groups went away, if I didn't, or some of them I had in my phone, so that was essentially almost the same thing as a list. But you have to own you, the, the audience. You mm -hmm. can't build your dream home on rented land. That's essentially what you're doing when you're relying on social media and all these different yeah. platforms. You're building your dream home on rented land. You're building your dream home on the sand almost. Yeah, it looks good because you're on the beach, but you're only one high tide away, one algorithm change, one crash, one hack away from everything coming down. So you have mm -hmm. to find a way to get them into your ecosystem, into your sphere. And that's what a, a valuable call to action will do. And so now when you're creating your call to action, because you spent so much time and effort looking up this, you know, their problems, their questions, their roadblocks, figuring out what they're struggling with, figuring out what their fears are. Now you have this giant list of data that you could fall back to on any time. So it's like, what am I going to create for a lead magnet? Mm -hmm. Well, I, let's say for content creating, a lot of people don't know what to say. All right. A lot of people are, are like scared. A lot of people are scared to hop on camera, don't have really confidence. A lot of people are trying to figure out what's the best platform for them. Just bundle that up, answer it, maybe do like a three-part mini video series. You specifically answering their specific questions, and now your lead magnet is exactly what they're looking for. And there's no questions about it that's going to be valuable because they literally told you that's what they're struggling for. And yeah. you have the answers to what they need prob you know, help for. So now your call to action is so compelling, not because you're the savviest marketer on the planet, but, but because you took the time and effort to un understand these people at a deeper level. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty cool. much the five steps. So to bring it all together, you want to find <laughs> yep. your ideal avatar. Yep. You want to and figure out where they And not just demographics, but psychographics yeah. as well. Psychographic, so what are they thinking exactly. and feeling? Yep. yep. You want to figure out where they congregate. Mm -hmm. You want to join their community. Yep. You want to connect with their ringleader. Mm -hmm. And then we want to bring them home. Bring them home. And that yeah. is how you ethically steal other people's audiences. I love it. And I, I guess there'd be some people who are sitting here thinking, oh, yeah, that's fine for you. You're a consultant selling online stuff. I want to give an example that I actually used exactly this methodology when I was actually heading up a large insurance company. So heading up the marketing team at large insurance company, we were selling car insurance, general insurance. And I had exactly the same thought. It's like, why are we going out there trying to find these people when there's actually a company that has access to people who are buying new cars? And there was a company called Motorweb and they were the place you went to to find out if the car you were buying um, was stolen, if it had any money owing on it, whether it had been in a car crash, all that kind of stuff. So we went to them and talked to them and said, hey, look, you know, you guys have actually got um, these people we're, we're, we're that we want to look after too. How can we work together? And we sat down and we kind of negotiated something that actually worked for both of us. And we added some value by ensuring we gave their clients some extra special stuff and they um, helped promote us. So it actually works no matter what it is that you are doing or selling it's like find somebody else who's got that audience and add value to them yeah and to add on to that i have a friend who literally used this strategy he was i think ranked number nine of a, in, in his insurance company and his company had over i think twelve thousand employees a pretty big company he was yeah. number nine in the nation at 24. he was making over close to half a million a year and he was doing that for a little while and i think a couple years after that he ended up quitting recently like this year or a little, um, I think late last year, to start his own insurance company. I think he's like 27 mm -hmm. now. And wow. what he did is he ended up starting a podcast so that he could pretty much find these big time players and connect with them. And those were also ended up becoming his clients. And now he went from creating, you know, getting half a million dollars a year for working for a big time company and miserable to having his mm -hmm. own bro insurance brokerage doing way more numbers making a way bigger impact and has a way larger presence online because he started up a podcast to start connecting with all these people in circle prospecting his way back up yeah 
Oh, that's fantastic. Look, I think, I mean, going back to what you said in the, in the beginning, I think life is too short to not be doing what you love with people you love. And so if you're finding yourself stuck in a role that you're not enjoying, it's a really good chance to go, well, what do I really want to do? Um, and I definitely recommend looking up the Ikigai model. It's, it's, it's a very good tool to kind of get you very crystal clear on that. What about in the tough times though, John? You know, because like we, businesses don't always go smoothly. We do, we do get distracted by bright, shiny objects. We maybe lose focus. How did you keep yourself, um, motivated and kind of inspired because even if you know your why sometimes things just don't work out the way you're expecting them to so what did you do to keep yourself yeah. on track so for me i never had role models looking up i had a very inverse mm. way of viewing the world because i didn't have a set person to look up to and model my life after what i did was i always took the good parts of people that I liked and implemented in my life and left out the bad parts and what I really fell back on is quotes and music that's where's oh. my strong suit, as I said because I never had someone look up to so I'll give you yep. two of the most powerful quotes and most impactful quotes that I use to help get me through tough times so the first is if life was easy it wouldn't be worth living God gives his best soldiers the worst missions I love nice. this one personally and even if you're not a person of faith because it that quote tells me that no matter what it is that life throws my way, mm -hmm. it's being thrown my way because only I could handle it. It's being thrown my way because despite whatever the circumstances may be, I am adequately equipped and prepared to face whatever I'm going through head on and not only survive, but to thrive and flourish. So that's my first quote that I love that I hold near and dear to my heart. The second quote, this is more like a hard work motivation type of quote. It's when you're born, you look like your parents. When you die, you look like your choices. Yeah. So you have to yes. ask yourself every day, what choices am I making? And are these choices in alignment with the person that I want to become? The mm -hmm. person that is impacting all the lives I want to impact. The person that is making the amount of success that I want you know, that I deem success to be the person that has the healthy family unit the person that is giving back in this community like is the are the choices that I'm making today in alignment with that person that I want to become in the future and if they are you're on the right track and if they're not you have to ask yourself and it may look hard because the other way you know turning your cheek may look a like the easier option but it's like when you as I said ask yourself these tough questions and remind yourself like Hey, like, whatever I end up looking like at the end of this, when it's all said and done, is that someone I feel like I, I would be okay looking at? And if the answer is yes, keep pushing through. You're on the right track. And if the answer is no, it's time to make some hard decisions. Mm, and make better choices sounds great hey john mm -hmm. you've done an amazing job i want to congratulate you on what you've done so far and, and i say uh, your your walk to wealth podcast is fantastic so i highly recommend people have a listen to that um if people want to get in contact with you how do they do that yeah definitely if anyone wants to get in contact with me you can get in contact with me definitely by going to www.walknumber2wealth.com from yep. there, you could reach out to me. If you're interested in any of the marketing stuff I got going on, mm -hmm. my website's down right now, so give me some time. I gotta, I gotta <laughs> hire somebody to make it look nice. So <laughs> full transparency, okay. Rome wasn't built in a day, so my website isn't currently up right now, but eventually it will be. So for the time being, check out the Walk to Wealth, uh, which is my podcast website. But for the time, yep. time being, that is where you could also connect with me at, and then we'll figure it out from there as my website gets built up. Yeah, and I have to say, I know, I know from first-hand experience that you know you're very um, responsive, and, you, and you're happy to actually chat to anybody because that's how we kind of first got to meet each other. So mm -hmm. um, do do that. Get a, get onto that walktowealth.com and and have a chat to John. Hey, look, thank you so much for your time, John. Pleasure as always. Um, I've got we've got those five steps that we can now take into our business, and I really appreciate you actually sharing that. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It was fun.